everybody. This video is woodcut versus lino. Which is better? There isn't one that's better. They're both great. They're both different materials. So this video is going to talk about carving techniques for woodcut and tar carving techniques for lino. Those of you pretty much have a lot of experience with carving lino, so I'm going to talk about the differences and how your working carving method on lino doesn't necessarily translate to the wood and the wood behaves in a different way. So it's going to be tips for both you lino cut carvers and you wood cut carvers. Wood's better. No, lino's better. They're both. They're both good. Okay, I'm going to go over my gear here just uh, to explain. So linoleum, of course, comes unmounted with the burlap on the back, but it also comes in blocks or mounted lino. Uh, so you'd set up registration a little bit differently. And uh, if we were printing on an etching press, it's much easier using an unmounted block. And then the wood that we're using, we're using Sheena. So the prep for Sheena is that you should darken the wood. It comes in it's this sort of color using diluted sumi, wiping it on the block. I just use a um, paper towel. Uh, you can do whatever darkness that you like. I did a little bit of a variation on these. I like it light enough so I can very clearly see not only the difference between the carved and uncarved areas, but also I can very easily see my marks, my drawn marks. If you're using the red carbon paper, which of course is even lighter than the black a little bit, then um, I try to keep my blocks a little bit lighter. So that's the first thing. And you want to make sure that they're totally dry before you try to carve. Also with linoleum, a lot of times I don't do any prep except to make sure that it's at right angles and maybe trim it up if it's wonky. Um, but it is a good idea to sand it. So I just use some 110 regular wood sandpaper and just, you know, 10 goes across the top. That will make it much easier for you to print flats. So I recommend that, although I don't do it a whole lot of the time myself, but I should. The other thing that I always do with lino is that I keep it wrapped up. Uh, so as soon as I buy it, um, if it comes, if it's a block like this and it comes, you know, unwrapped and anything, I just use plastic bags from the market and cut them into little pieces so that I can wrap them up. The lino cures in the air and it will get slowly more and more brittle. So you want to extend the shelf life of this and so I always wrap them up. Once I've made them and printed them and I'm finished with them, I, I don't worry about that. It can cure, you know, great. Um, nice thing about lino is that it's very durable and so on this block, which I've used for years as a demo block, I have pencil drawing, I have Sharpie from when I went over my transfer drawing. You can, you know, easily erase any drawing off of here. You really don't have to worry about denting or marring the surface. It's pretty uh, tough stuff. It is was flooring. Uh, so, you know, gives you some idea. Sheena is not in that category at all. It's very easy to ding or muck up the Sheena. So once I get the Sheena um, and I I'm going to use it. I unwrap it um, and I darken it. And then once it's all dry, I wrap it back up again. Sometimes with plastic, sometimes with um, like heavy craft paper or even newsprint. Not really to save it from curing or drying out because the wood will slowly dry also and become very um, splintery over time. But that takes a long time. And I notice up here in Humboldt that it really isn't a thing up here. So you don't have to worry about that. So darkening the Sheena, transferring your drawing. I have another handout that talks about transferring the drawing and everything. The other thing that a lot of printmakers do, and I don't just because uh, I really don't think it's necessary, but I thought I'd try it for once and just see. And that is, this is unmounted lino and I've painted over the whole thing with um, diluted acrylic paint, just diluted enough so I don't get uh, streaks, so it's just nice and flat. And 
then to transfer the image, I could use I could use the red transfer paper from McLean's, uh, and it would probably show okay. But I thought no, it'd be better if I used either. This is Conti on a piece of tracing paper, and I also had some just white chalk, chalkboard chalk, and so I just used that for my transfer paper. So had my drawing here right and then I just slipped this underneath and then once I had the chalk on there which was very easy to see I actually went over it with a metallic pen um, which is this gold here so that I could see it and the reason people do this is you can see my carved marks are very dramatic and they really show um, I've gotten so used to just the more subtle way that the uncarved marks are, are lighter, I mean, sorry, the carved marks are lighter than the darker mark, but I have to say, you know, it's very dramatic and it's kind of fun uh, carving like this. Before you print, if I was printing in black, I probably would just leave the black as it is and ink it up in black, but uh, I, you know, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure this would come off with warm water and Comet or Ajax or something like that. And then trying to keep this as dry as possible, and maybe would do it on some paper towels. And then I would dry this under some weights so it's nice and flat before I try to print it. Another thing that I've always completely argued against and been absolutely uh, <laughs> very vocal about how awful I think it is, and I still think it's kind of awful, but I thought I have a bunch of these. Uh, these are Sheena grab bag pieces you can get from McLean's and they're really inexpensive. And I thought, okay, I will sacrifice one of those. And I actually painted the acrylic paint on here. And I did the same thing. I transferred the image using, uh, I think the Conti paper and then went over it with, again, my metallic pens that I have so that I could see it. And then I started carving. So I have to say, uh, especially on camera, this is really dramatic. You can really see what I'm doing. Um, I also found that in some sort of weird benefits, I think with the lino, there really isn't any benefit. I mean, the yeah, I didn't notice any real difference in how it carved or anything. However, in the Sheena, having that acrylic layer on top does definitely cut down on the splintering of the wood. Now, how I'm gonna get it off of there before I print, I'm really not sure. Uh, maybe I have to sand it really lightly. I can't really scrub it with Ajax. I don't wanna do that to the wood or it'll puff up. So I'm not really sure, but it's a test and um, it's weird to carve through because you're carving through that layer of plastic acrylic. Um, so it's an experiment. Um, always willing to try it. Okay, more of my gear, snacks very important. I also have some vet wrap and I wrap these around my carving tools. Uh, the ones that have handles like this, they're very slippery in my hands so I like that it, it makes it easier to hold on to. And these tools are very squared off. Um, these get very grungy. Um, so they cushion it and make it so I can um, carve for a much longer amount of time. This you find at a um, animal store, pet store. The linoleum carving tools, because I hold them way up down here, this can actually get very abrasive on your hands. So sometimes I put vet wrap around these. Just thought I'd show you these wooden ones. You may not have ever seen these before. These two are really special to me because these belong to my dad and my uncle. And they used them back in the late 50s, early 60s. So they're very special to me. However, I have found two other ones. These are more thrashed. So sometimes you find them in thrift stores or, you know, collectible stores. These are really great and I highly recommend them. Notice that they're smaller. They're a little bit smaller. They're a little bit shorter and um, the circumference right here is a little bit less. So for my smaller hands, they just have a really nice grip. So. If you ever find them, I highly recommend that you grab those. Other things I have, this is a feel. 
uh, linoleum carving tool. These are really beautiful Swiss tools. I have just this one. I personally don't like this kind of tool because it's really meant to be held like this. And um, that's kind of not how I hold a tool or feel most comfortable holding a tool for carving. But these are excellent, excellent tools. Um, these, of course, are tools from McLean's. They're all from Japan. Um, other things that I have, I have a stiff wired brush. This I've had forever. Uh, but even a little stencil brush, this is really handy to clear your block of all the little schmutz that you've carved, um, even as you're carving or definitely before you go to print. If you bought tools from McLean's, they probably came with... <laughs> Um, this tubing around them to protect them. Just so you know, you can buy more of this at the hardware store, buy it by the foot if you want any more of that. Also, I have my X-Acto knife, so I'm gonna show you how you can carve, especially on the wood, with the X-Acto knife. And that I learned from one of my mentors. Couple other things that I have. This is a non-skid pad. I had this on the material list for you guys. You can find rolls of this. It's a shelf liner, sort of rubbery plastic stuff. Really great to secure your piece of wood. Not really secure it, but keep it from sliding around and really help you hold on to your block while you're carving. Those are really great. And then the other thing is when I get ready to carve, I tape up my hand. This might sound really silly, and I guess it is, but it's, you know, it's like what athletes do, right? But I've found that because of the way I hold my tools, um, sort of like using a pencil, I really push against this finger. And also, as I'm holding my hand, I tend to use my pinky as kind of like a stabilizer. And a lot of, of carving, especially on a big block where my hand's up on the block of the wood, can kind of be owie on my finger. So I, I always do that. I also have these um, arthritis craft gloves, which are um, kind of great. They're compression gloves. You can find them. I've seen them at Joanne Fabrics. Um, notice my right hand one is definitely more used than my other one. Um, I find these help a lot when I'm carving, especially like a full day of carving. They just really, really help. Okay, so um, that's basically my stuff, except one other thing. I am sitting on a very squeaky, sorry, uh, but adjustable chair. So I adjust my chair so my table is as high as possible. Um, that way I'm not bending over too much. Another option, is these are my special, literally I've been using these for 25 years, these two books. These are my super duper special, bring my block up so I don't hurt my back blocks. So these are just the right size, or height I should say, so that I can rest my elbows on the table and carve like this and they really help me quite a bit. So if you can't adjust your chair or find a chair table combo, that gets you closer, um, your back and neck will be happy for that. Maybe find even just one book that you're putting it up on to um, get closer here. Magnifying, I always wear reading glasses. I'm of that age where I definitely need to do that. So that's something to think about. Also, the last and probably the most important thing is build in somehow that you're taking breaks on a regular basis. Um, set your phone for 20 minute, 30 minute, intervals or something and at the end of that time get up stretch look into the distance go walk around a little bit even if it's just for five minutes or something and then come back and carve again when you're carving a large block you guys are carving six by eight which is not too huge I mean it's about like that big a little bigger um, you know you want to have even and consistent carving across the whole block you don't want one block to look uh, like it got all your close attention and then the other part looks really rushed. You want to have a, a nice control and consistency across the whole thing. You also don't normally, when you're carving, start at one end and then just, you know, go to the other end. I think it's better to jump around, especially if you don't have a fully realized plan for um, how you're going to balance all your carving. So like for both of these, how I started them, 
I had a pretty clear idea of how I wanted the thumb to look. And then I'm just kind of jumping around and moving out from that center part. Usually I have a pretty good idea of one part of my drawing. Like with this one, I knew kind of established what these were gonna be pretty early on. And then I moved out from there. Another very important thing when you're figuring out where you're gonna carve is lighting and light. Now I have my table turned this way away from the window because it's better and works better for the filming. Normally I have this so the window's right in front of me. That gives me raking light across my block, which is really good. I also have this right desk lamp and when I'm carving, I sometimes have it like this again, so it's raking light and it really highlights the carved mark so I can see what I'm doing. The other thing I do too, and this is, has as much to do with age as anything else, is I can't carve at night anymore. I need so much light, uh, otherwise I my eyes just really get strained. So, um, you know, think about working and having being close to a window. And another thing I just want to say too is that the window over here doesn't really work for me because I'm right-handed, right? So as I'm carving, my hand's going to be casting a shadow from the window. So um, this normally would not be a good setup. And again, that's why I have this drafting lamp here to, to help. The main difference with linoleum from wood is the grain or the lack of grain. Lino doesn't have any grain and there's pretty much no structure to it. I mean, that's why it's got the burlap on the back. So you can cut very freely in any direction. There's no resistance when you carve one way compared to another one. Woodcut, of course, has a grain and it is a natural material. So you may find that when you hit a certain spot, um, it might have a little bit of a different quality. It might be um, a little bit more brittle, a little harder. I mean, Sheena is beautiful, so there's not much difference. Um, but you still might hit sections that carve a little bit differently, and you might need to adjust your carving style accordingly. Um, sorry, get distracted there. Okay, so um, what used to always be said then is that you could tell a lino print because it had more fluid, um, curving sort of carved marks. Maybe, but you know, you can carve curving sort of carved marks in a woodcut too. So it, it just depends on the material, depends uh, the style of the carver. As I was sort of saying before, it's like I really don't think I carve the material differently. Um, I do it the same, it's just the material responds a little bit differently. Okay, so just some basic things here that when you're carving a woodcut and you're going with the grain, it will be a little bit easier to carve. And when you're carving against the grain, it's a little louder. You hear this kind of thing. Also, if you're using especially a larger tool, let me see if I can get this to happen, and you're going deep, see how this splintered on the edge? Much better when you have a mark off the edge that you come in from the edge. And that way I didn't get any splintering on the edge of the material. Very similar kind of thing happens with lino that if I come off the edge of the material with my tool buried fairly deep, I get some chipping of the material on the end. So for instance, the lino sort of does that on the end, whereas the wood, um, kind of did this and then splintered like a long sort of piece off the edge like that. So, you know, be careful about that. Either material, um, you want to come in off the edge and then you can have a, uh, you can avoid that. But, or sometimes what I do like I'm doing here is I sort of come up and be a little bit more shallow right when I hit that edge, and it can minimize that happening. So that's something to pay attention with on the edges of the mark, edges of the blocks. 
basic stuff. There are U gouges and there are V gouges. Um, the linoleum carving tools are very, what I call a soft V. They're more like, oops, they're more like, you know, like that rather than like that. Um, the wood carving tools are definitely a very sharp V at the bottom. They will, of course, give you different sorts of marks. Um, the V tool is meant to be two knives, two knives put together, and it puts them at an angle. So, you, you know, think of it with a knife, you carve this side, this side. Well, the V carve um, tool does that for you, and you get that um, nice, really crisp, sharp sort of carved mark with a V gouge. What the V gouge doesn't do quite as well, or actually what I think is a way to think of is it does it really well, is you could use it for doing sharp turns and it's gonna kind of kick up the material in a more uneven sort of way. And I think that's, oh, this one's uh, pretty dull. Okay, we're gonna move on from that. This is also a V gouge. This is like a one and a half millimeter, much smaller. You can see just really crisp, kind of sharp marks with a V gouge. Basically, if you're carving with a V gouge, you end up with a mark that looks like this. <laughs> like it tapers on both ends like that. As it compared to a U gouge where you get a mark that sort of looks like that. Or you can put the U gouge in and then stop and you get a mark sort of like that. So if I come over here, on here, and I carve, I can stop and then I get a flat sort of edge or I can come in and go back out again and I get more of a rounded sort of taper. Same thing happens on the lino, but on the lino uh, that, like when you do a hard stop and then lift the material off, depending, but it's a little bit of a softer sort of mark than when you do it on the wood. Because when you do it on the wood, you're hitting, well, actually, if you're going um, against the grain, you hit up with the grain and you get this really crisp sort of edge. What I was doing over there is I was going, I'm sorry, let me say that again. If you're going against the grain, you stop like along the edge and you get a really crisp mark. If you're going with the grain, a lot of times you get these little wood pigtails and if you try to take them off, you get a little bit more of a um, jagged sort of mark. So to get that really crisp kind of mark, you wanna go with the grain. The other thing is, of course, you could do this and you could come in the other way to make a mark like this or just come in and back out again and have a similar tapers on both sides. So when, when you're carving the wood, you can use the grain to do your work for you in a way that you kind of can't with lino. So on these blocks, I've made some distorted um, grids on here that I want to carve. Now I could carve them with a, um, a little V U ish gouge and I would probably come in from each corner to try to get the crispest, crispest <laughs> sort of corners like that, like using the little bottom of this V gouge to give me these precise little edges. I could do the same thing. This is a one millimeter U gouge for the wood cut, but I'm not really getting really precise corners here because the tool is larger than these little precise corners. So what would be better is if I used a V gouge, which of course has this really sharp, these are so hard to hold, uh, this sharp, corner and I could come in, do each corner so I get that really crisp corner in the carve or along the edge. Okay. 
and that's better. I get a little bit more crisp corners on there. Um, but really, the easiest thing to do, especially with the wood, is to use an X-Acto knife. So think of this as, um, as a knife, right? Um, and one thing that Roxanne used to tell me to do, or I've seen other people tell me to do this, I think, is take some pliers and actually just snip off that very delicate last little edge there. What I do is just make sure that if that does snap off into my wood, that I'm sure to get it out of that wood so that, you know, when I do this, I'm not slicing my hand open or, you know, ruining a, a roller when I try to ink it up. So I'm going to hold this a little bit of an angle so I'm not undercutting and I can just go right in like this to establish the edge. And then in wood, I could just go in and pop it out. And it's just going to make this extremely consistent, perfect little grid. So for small little marks like that, I use the knife or the, yeah, the X-Acto knife. I also cut this section right here is with the X-Acto knife. So anytime I have really small marks that I want to be really precise or inside corners, I use the X-Acto. You can do the same thing on Lino. Again, be sure I'm angling away from the material that I don't want to cut. But when I go in, I can't do exactly the same sort of, it's not as easy to pop out as it is with the woodcut. I can kind of do it, but it's more like I have to crumble it out. So I can just go in. Not as easy. But I can slowly, come on, Lino. There we go. Pop that out and get a nice, um, really sharp um, corners on that. So to do some sort of checkerboard, it's great, but also any sort of inside corner. So on this block, it's the same kind of thing. These marks right here, I use the X-Acto on so I could get that precise thing. Here, if I wanna cut this, I could go in like this, and then to clear it, because it's larger than just those little um, those little squares, I could come in with a U-gouge and then have it pop off those edges from there. And the really great, again, thing about wood is that uh, it will pop right off along that line that I cut, which is really great. There we go. So one thing that's, uh, or not one thing, I say that a lot. Another thing that is very important is that we've got our U gouges and we've got V gouges, say, so U gouges and V gouges. The difference between the Japanese tools and the linoleum carving tools, say, is these are more shallow. So the Japanese carving tools are gonna to be more like this or more like this. Whereas the American tools and the lino carving tools are more like this. So that means that when you carve these using these different tools and say I wanna make a carve, you know, where I bury the tool about that much that's fine, but in a Japanese tool, if you're burying it this much, right, where you've got these leading edges of the U-gouge, you're gonna get um, splintering along the wood on those angles. This, you have more room here, right? You can carve quite deep with the American tools or the Lino tools, which have very deep sort of U's to them or V's to them. Another thing, always another thing, is that I'm right-handed. I tend to turn the tools this way towards myself a little bit. I try not to. I try to use them straight up and down. But if I pivot this towards myself, I might be burying this lead edge a little bit, in which case it's very hard to not get 
uh, a really jagged, oh, this one's nice and sharp, so I'm getting good carving marks, but it's very hard to not get a really jagged edge along that area. So in general, you need to carve more shallow with the Japanese tools or the wood carving tools from Japan. But that doesn't mean that you can't carve deeply. It just means that you have to start with rather shallow marks and then slowly make it make it deeper. Very often, oh, I've got a slip, so I've got to work it in. When I'm starting to outline something, an image on my board, I'm usually using the number one millimeter in woodcut, or I'm using the number one tool in lino because I want a very thin sort of edge and I will more than likely go back in and make that white outline larger, have more character, but I usually start with just that white edge because often that white edge then gets carved into and it becomes my background. So it in effect, uh, get that edge, the further edge gets broken down and it just becomes part of my background. Okay, but what if I have an image like this? The easiest, most consistent way to get a good circle is notice my right hand isn't moving at all. I've planted the tool and now I'm twirling the block. That's not a really perfect. Uh, let's do this so it'll spin easier. Plant the tool, just holding it and pushing with consistent pressure and rotating the block. Be really careful, again, that you're not burying the tool. Like with this, notice I'm holding this at a higher angle. I'm getting much more of a jagged kind of outline. So I'm keeping it at this kind of halfway up the side of the, the U gouge. Okay, but what if this circle is um, in the middle of a field of white or a field that I've almost carved everything away around it? And so it's going to need to get deeper so that nothing prints around it. Well, I could establish that outline with that tool. And then I come in with another tool and then just slowly go over it and work it until it's as deep as I need it to be. For small areas, say, for instance, this shape right here, it doesn't have to be that deep in order to be completely white. So it isn't, uh, it, it's a question of how wide it is and how deep it is. So it has to be uh, able to support the brayer over that length and be able to support the paper over that length uh, in order to be white. If you're doing a block like this one, where I have quite a lot of area here where I do not want it to print, I have to carve pretty deeply on here to make sure that it doesn't print. A lot of what you end up doing with your carving is what I call cleanup. So for instance, I established this edge here, but I can see there's still a little ridge right along the edge from some material that's like hanging out right along that edge. So I have to go back in and I want to clean that, otherwise it's going to print as a small little mark that's right next to my uh, that edge of that black shape on there. One thing I like to do with the linoleum tools in particular is you can place them in the material and jiggle them back and forth. So it sort of makes this uh, rickrack kind of mark, which can be cool, give you a very different sort of texture. You can, of course, make small marks that all are unidirectional and they could start to create a texture or a tone in your work. You can also do hatching or cross hatching. So
this would end up being the opposite of this. So this, by carving out in between my uh, gel pen there, I'm going to get black lines with white grid spaces. Here I'm getting white lines with black grid spaces. So it's fun to shift back and forth and have different areas. Changing direction, changing the scale, all these ways are ways that you can establish the edges of things and establish whether something has a three-dimensional sort of quality, what the surface is like. A lot of times when you have areas of your print where you've cleared but you've left material, like I've left some material in here that I specifically want to print, um, and there's some material in here, and, and it can be difficult to judge what that looks like until you print it. Same here, I've left some random little marks in here. And I'm gonna wait until I print it to see whether I wanna clear that further or whether I like having a little bit of that tone in there. Can't put the material back, so I always try to err on the side of carving a little bit less than I think I might want um, so that I can adjust after I proof and after I see what it looks like printed. Some of the most beautiful marks and um, looking at other people's prints is always a good thing, is doing combinations of marks. So for instance, if you come in and make a line and then you want to add a different sort of character to it, this is a much larger um, U gouge. You could come in and I'm going to have to come in and see how those won't really disconnect. So I could come in and cut. Come on. There we go. Right, so you could combine marks. I made the line and then here I'm coming in again with that one millimeter U gouge. So I have, you know, like a compound sort of line has a different sort of quality to it. So every mark you carve is white, and that's what you're doing. You're removing the material, and so a lot of people say that it's, you know, you're doing the opposite. You're re removing the whites and leaving the, um, the material to be the blacks and the prints. Why is this slipping so much? Sometimes with, uh, oops, now I'm using the wood carving tool. Sometimes with the linoleum, you'll hit a spot which is really brittle, too. So, I mean, even though uh, it doesn't happen as often, um, but that can happen, too. I lost my chance of thought. Okay, so with lino, it's uh, pretty easy to control and keep the tool in the same depth. And notice I'm even, like, moving the block and then keep going. But if you're just learning and just starting out or you, you feel like you don't have a control, it's a lot better to just carve maybe half an inch, uh, you know, and not get too far out with the tool so that you have control over the marks that you're making. Notice the way that I hold the tool. So I do hold it like a, a pencil and I tend to hold it in this kind of position. With a block, even a, with a small block like this, I can hold this in my hand like this, and then I use this finger, sometimes both, as stops on my tools. So I'm pushing with my whole arm here, and then this is a break. So, um, so every time I set my hands down, um, I've made this unit that can move around. And every time I carve, my right hand is basically in the same position. I'm moving the block around so I can make some different marks, but basically I'm keeping my right hand in the same place. And so that is just efficient, that rotating the block around so you're always carving in the same direction is good rather than trying to I don't know carve this way that's not uh, that doesn't really work it's like you want to carve 
you're right-handed, you want to carve, you know, counterclockwise is a lot easier than carving the other direction. I mean, you can, but I tend to hold my hands differently so that I can see what I'm doing when I go clockwise. But I find it's much more comfortable for me to carve anti-clockwise, as the Brits say. I hope these tips have helped. I hope you feel a little more confident with uh, jumping in on trying woodcut or carving your lino. Um, one last tip, do a check-in, self-check. How tired are you? How agitated are you? How calm are you? How rested are you? When there's areas of your block that are more important than others or more detailed, something like that, I uh, approach those when I am, am rested, right? And there's always some areas on a block, maybe in this case it would be the background, I don't know, um, where it's a little less uh, intense in terms of my concentration and I can uh, move more quickly through those areas. So I often move around based on concentration level too. like work really tight or, or areas where I know I have to be real controlled in my carving and then I can give myself a rest and do some of the easier parts and move back and forth. So I hope these tips help. Good luck with your carving. Oh, did you did you decide whether woodcut or linocut is best? No, I haven't decided either. <laughs>